I'm hearing patients call them doc and they're like, no PA. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'm seeing you do everything the doctor is doing. So what you mean PA? What is this PA? Hi, guys. Hi, everybody. Welcome to eShadowing. Hey, Yay. guys. Happy Monday. <laughs> Hi, I have Brianna Grant with me. Hey, Bree. That's me. Hey. <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for coming on today. You're very welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, thank you. All righty, guys, we're going to get right into it. Brianna is a neurosurgery PA, and she's actually also a new grad. So she's going to share all her experience about PA school, the process for her. And, you know, she's just, you know, straight out, she graduated in August 2020. Um, so she can give us insight on that. And especially, um, I'm really interested to hear how school changed for her with the pandemic. Because, like, when I heard about that and then, like, you know, yeah. the, saw your post, I felt terrible. Like, what about the students that are still in school? They can't I know. It's even worse now. I can only imagine. Oh, my goodness. So I can't wait to hear all about that. So, um, Rihanna, um, so just I first want to hear about your experience, how you found out to, um, about the PA career, your path to becoming a PA, and then we'll go on to, like, talk about PA school. So I'm going to just let you dive in. All right. So welcome, everybody. Once again, my name is Brianna. Um, so my path to PA, whew, it wasn't easy. I'm going to tell you that much. Um, I started off working as a medical scribe in the ER. And that's when I first found out about the PA profession because I was on the pre-med um, route to go to medical school. Um, my dad has five sisters. I think three of them are MDs. So it's like, you know, I always knew about medical school. So, you know, scribing the first day with a physician assistant, it's like the entire time, you know, I'm hearing patients call them doc and they're like, no PA. So I'm like, oh, you know, I'm seeing you do everything the doctor is doing. So what you mean PA? What is this PA? So that's how I got exposed. They explained it to me. I did my research. And the more and more I worked alongside the PA versus the doctor, I was like, well, why not? Like, you know, why, why am I just now finding out about this? So dug a little deeper and then jumped off the pre-med, went to pre-PA. So from there, um, I worked as a clinical assistant in a psychiatry office for about a year. And then I transitioned into orthopedics. And I worked in orthopedics for about a year and a half before I got accepted to PA school. So um, like I said, I'm not the traditional route. I did apply twice. So um, applying my first year to PA school, I applied to about 43 schools. 43, let me, let me repeat it again, wow. 43 schools. Wait, hold on, 43? Yes. You're 43. Wait, what made you apply to, oh my goodness, that's exhausting. It, it was very exhausting. It was very time, money, everything. So I knew that the PA field at the time when I was applying, you know, I had a lot of friends applying to medical school, a lot of friends applying to PA school and the stats that were coming out, it seemed that getting into PA school was a little bit more competitive than getting into medical school at that time. So I was like, mm, I don't know. I know I just graduated with my bachelor's. I had just got into a master's program. I have my master's in forensic science from the University of Florida. And I was like, um, I knew I graduated with a 3.0 on the dot from FAU, um, my bachelor of science. I did fail two classes. I failed organic chemistry and I failed physics with an F, both Fs. Yes. So because I knew this, uh -huh. mm -hmm. No, I was going to say, do you think that was like a major hindrance because you had those two? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because what happened was when I applied to those 43 schools, uh, I got denied from 43 schools. Why did I get denied? CASPA cal calculated my GPA instead of it being 3.0 like I saw on my transcript from FAU. They calculated it as like a 2.6, maybe a 2.65. So they calculated, even though I retook those classes, I retook physics, I retook um, organic chemistry. It still didn't matter because they average everything in together. So my F now looked like a D plus or a C minus. So yeah, it was definitely um, definitely a hard pathway. But and then of course you know applying to PA school the first time around, I didn't have guidance. I didn't have anybody. Um, of course, I had people that I was in a pre PA club with at FAU that were doing the same thing that I was doing, trying to apply to PA school. So we were all learning together. I didn't have people to tell me, oh, only apply to one school. Let them calculate your GPA first and see where you stand at that point. Because if I knew I had a 2.6 GPA, I would not have paid for those 43 schools. I'll tell you that much. 
But um, blessing in disguise, you live and you learn. So um, what I did was when I found out that my GPA was calculated so low, I then did post back classes. I did immunology. I retook organic chemistry again because when I had retaken it, I, got, I ended up getting a C. So I took it again. I ended up getting an F because the second day in class, my house burned down. So <laughs> I don't know why I didn't drop the class. I should have dropped the class, but I kept going. Ended up with another F. And then I got an A. So um, I know. And I ended up taking maybe about five or six more classes. And then I finished my master's in forensic science. So I had that. I think I finished my master's with like a 3.9. Yeah, like a 3.9 GPA. So I was serious. I was like, at this point, if y'all not letting me in your PA school, you don't deserve me. That's what I was saying. <laughs> so um, fast forward, I applied the second year. I only applied to one school first just to make sure what they would calculate my GPA as. And of course, CASPA calculated my GPA as 2.99. So for most of you guys, you know that the minimum requirement to get into PA school for a lot of programs is a 3.0. So what happens is when you apply to these PA schools, some of them have an algorithm set up that when you apply, if you don't even meet that bare minimum, the application doesn't even come to their desk. It automatically gets booted and you get that denial letter. So I was like, you know what? Yeah, exactly. You have to learn the CASPA system and the way that they go to these schools. So what I did was I researched, I sat down and I went through every PA school in the United States of America. And I wrote, I did, I made an Excel sheet. I'm telling you, I was dedicated. I was like, I'm gonna be a PA, okay, period. So I made an Excel sheet. I wrote down all the PAs, I'm telling you. <laughs> I wrote down all the PA programs, their GPA requirements that I met um, and the time that I applied, uh, there were at least, I think I applied to 13 schools. So 13 schools were accepting a little bit below a 3.0. I think it was like one school was like a 2.8. Another school was like 2.75. I know nowadays those that doesn't really exist. I know that they raised the bar much higher. But the good thing about my school that I got accepted to, um, Western University of Health Sciences in California, what they do is they actually... You, when you apply, you actually have to fill out this form of the classes that they care about and your latest grade in that class. So according to Western University, when they calculated my GPA, I was in the top ten, the top 10 percent of their cohort that they were admitting. Exactly. So that's another thing, too. It's like finding a school that's not going to just take the CASPA GPA that's calculated because CASPA sucks. I'm going to put it clearly. They, if I can speak to a representative, I would. Just know I would go. Okay. Oh my gosh. So yes. Yeah, so fast forward. So I applied to 13 schools. I actually got two interviews. I only went to Western University and I got accepted early. So they normally accept people, I think, March. I had my interview September and they accepted me December 8th. So that was everything up until oh, PA. <laughs> Like, you know, I would read about your story on Instagram, but I had no idea, like, it was that, like, oh, yeah. I'm so I'm beyond impressed, inspired, like, the comments <laughs> are crazy. I can't even keep up with all the comments. Oh, my and God. I didn't even know there was comments. Yes, there's comments. Oh, someone said F Casa. Ooh, I'm there with you. <laughs> No, Brie. Oh my gosh. Like, I can't, I really can't keep up, guys. Usually I'm on my laptop, but the internet is down. So I'm having to use my phone now. So, like, okay, first, let me play your Instagram because they're going to want to know your, they're going to have questions for you. I'm not going to be able to go through all the questions. So, right. it's okay if they, they like ask you on, like, you know, email, Instagram. Absolutely. Questions. Every day I get, I get plenty of questions and I answer everybody's questions. I give out my phone number. I do one on ones. I am all for all of that. So, definitely, you can definitely put my Instagram and they can reach out via Instagram and then we can okay. dig deeper if we need to. Okay, first let me, I'm gonna share her Instagram guys because I will not be able to get through all those comments and questions. So it's, Bri how do I spell it? Uh, at Queen, Q-U-E-E-N underscore B-E-E -E underscore 32. Queen B32. And then at the P-A snit. Uh, wait, okay, how do I, Um, it's the like, T-H-E-P-A-S-N-I-T-C-H or underscore. Right. It's, 
Yeah, it's the underscore PA snitch. That's my business that I started. Because once again, as you guys see, and I'm pretty sure a lot of you people are going through that as well, seeing that it's very difficult to get in, you know, to know the information. Like I know that CASPA does its algorithm and I know that there's certain schools that go above that, you know, just knowing the nuances and the little ins and outs of different things that can get you past that point is very helpful. So I provide all of that in services. Oh, my, listen, hold on. Let me just write the comments. I, okay, first of all, the fact that you applied to 43 schools, big ups to you, and the fact that you were so relentless. Everybody, I I, I, I had no idea about this, but if I did, I would have, like, brought you on way sooner because they need, I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad I still brought you on before April, so before this yes. cycle starts. Absolutely. I'm helping so many people right now. They mm -hmm. need to hear this because, like, I'm, and it's so different from when I applied. Because, you know, I I applied in 2013. That was, like, oh almost. Gosh, that's like, so long ago. Yes, so, and, yes. There's so much, so many more PA programs, so many more schools. It's so, so, so competitive. But you can get in, guys. You can get in. Do not you give can. up. You can. Like, Absolutely. Okay. The things you did. I ha oh, my gosh. Like, you are amazing. <laughs> You're so silly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, like you, and you're a PA now. Because I remember when you started PA school, and I didn't like. Cause yes. I, I remember, and I text you, and I was like so proud of you. you did, I but still have that text message. Yes, and, but I didn't know what you went through. I didn't know that you went through all of that to get there, and now you're right. a PAC working in neurosurgery. And you guys, let me tell you, neuro like is the is neuro is hard. Like ring. <laughs> Were you able to get scholarships for PA school? Um, I did not get any scholarships, but I didn't apply. Um, but while I was in PA school, I applied for um, a scholarship that I was nominated for, and I actually got the scholarship um, during school. And it was $500. I mean, every little bit counts, absolutely. The okay. GRE, I did take the GRE, but... Um, uh, that's, a, that's another thing. It's okay, Rodlin. I was just answering a few questions. The GRE, okay. um, I took it without studying at all, and I ended up getting a 290, and then I ended up doing Magoosh for two months, and I went from a 290 to a 299. You did Magoosh, too? I did, I recommended Magoosh. Oh, I, listen, anybody that asked for recommendations, I'm like, you have to do Magoosh. I only did I Magoosh did for the math portion, and then there's a specific Princeton vocab book that's like, this small, this tall, that's at Barnes and Nobles, I swear by it. I flew through the vocab um, section by doing, just studying that little book. So that's what I would recommend for the GRE. But luckily my school didn't require the GRE, so I was good on that. Because most schools, they want you to be above a 300. And of course I had a 299, just like my damn GPA 2.99. I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> but I'm sorry, continue, Rodlin. I'm glad that you're no, back. No, 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 thank you so much for that, y'all. Like my phone went out, but um, yeah, I was saying neurosurgery is, well, neurology period is hard. Neurology, um, renal, nephrology is hard. Like one of yes, the- Yes, nephro is hard. hard. I mean, I just don't like ortho, but my thing is I like cardio. I like emergency medicine. <laughs> Ooh, cardio. Listen, we're going to have to get together. You're going to have to teach me these EKGs because, listen. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm all right with EKGs. But neurology, neurosurgery, I mean, I don't even know really anything about neurosurgery. So I'm ready to learn. And then especially as a new grad, everybody is so impressed for you to go from applying to 43 schools, getting denied by all, all the schools, persevering, like di literally dissecting CASPA, doing what you yep. have to do and getting in, graduating, becoming a PA. Oh, wh when did you take the pants? I took the pants. So we finished August 31st. Oh, that's another thing too. So let me just briefly describe COVID. So um, in March, I went, I was in my urgent care rotation. I was treating patients. A lot of patients were coming in asking about the COVID because, you know, it was brand new in March. And, you know, I was educating them as much as we were educated. And, um, <clears throat> I think on my my second to last shift in the urgent care, I got a uh, an email saying, remove yourself from your rotation effective immediately. And I was like, great. So I got home and then we got another email saying, you're not going back to your rotations until further notice. I was like, okay, well, and then we got another email, make sure you stay within 70 miles of your rotation. I was like, I'm not listening to y'all. I'm going so home. This, was in March. this was in March. This was in March. So I booked then, a ticket. Wait, how, how far were you from graduating? Like, I was, I was supposed to graduate. to graduate. Yeah, I was supposed to graduate July, July 31st. Okay. So, um, 
So yeah, like I said, they pulled us from our rotation. When I found out that we were, um, that they don't have an effective date for us to go back, I was like, mm, I'm not going to stay in California on a lockdown. I'm going home. So I went home just in time before they shut down everything. And um, that's how I got introduced to the person. Florida, by the way, guys. Yes, born and raised. I'm Jamaican from Jamaican background, but I'm born and raised in Florida. So uh, because COVID happened, they pulled us from our rotation. We had to do some online rotation. It was so bogus. It. They, I feel like it was a waste of time, whatever, but nothing, nothing, nothing can substitute the one-on-one actually seeing and physically touching, treating patients, period. So of course, you know, I was a little bit upset about that, but what could they do? It's COVID. So they had us doing this virtual, um, seeing a patient, asking questions and the computer talking back to you. We did that up until June, June, we were able to return to our rotations. So I did my June rotation, I did my July rotation, and then my August rotation. And so because of COVID, it pushed us back a month. Not only did it push us back a month, we were no longer able to have graduation. So I know that was like, that that broke my heart. I was like, listen, I don't I, I, I graduated my bachelor's. People said I wouldn't do that. I had another master's before getting this master's. I was like, this was so important for me. Like everybody had their tickets booked from Florida to come to uh, um California, everybody booked their uh, Airbnb. It, it was just a big disappointment. But at the end of the day, I still made it. I'm here. So, you know, life has setbacks, but you have to, you got to keep pushing forward, period. So instead of graduating July, I graduated August 31st, or my last rotation was August 31st. And then I did a road trip home with my, um, one of my classmates. We stopped in every state along the way going to Florida. And then I think I made made it home maybe September 16th or 17th. And I want to say I took I took the pants on October 1st and I found out that I passed on October 7th. Wow, Brie, oh my gosh. The girl, <laughs> you 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 went through all that to get in. You were in PA school, almost done, and then this pandemic hits blocks you from graduating and really like celebrating but like oh my gosh your story your story is so inspirational i'm sorry guys that i'm not even like reading the comments i should (laughs) i'm just so into this i'm so inspired that's amazing congratulations and i felt so bad when i heard like schools like um well rotations were canceled graduation got pushed But like I said, I'm still thankful and I still with anything that is a negative that becomes presented to you or anything that, you know, hampers on your spirit or whatever. I What I like to do is say, okay, it can be worse than this. So it's not. So I'm still going to be thankful in the darkness. You get what I'm saying? Because now look at it like I'm sorry if I had to do PA school online. I don't don't know if I could do that. Like I'm looking at, you know, I'm counseling some of the students that are in first year now of PA school at my, at my, um, at Western university and it's all online. You know, we used to do clinical assessment where we, you know, we look in each other's ears, we flip each other's eyes, we do Benny punctures on each other. And I'm like, they don't get any of that. So it's like, I'm still thankful for what I went through. Even though we had those few months that I had to be away and pulled from my rotations, I'm still thankful nonetheless. Absolutely. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. I feel, listen, I'm praying and hoping this thing ends soon because these students like that are in programs, nursing programs, PA school, medical school, like to be a radiology tech, any healthcare program, like it's so crucial that you get that hands-on experience, that you touch patients, interact with them, get comfortable. I feel terrible about all that absolutely um, wow okay so everybody i got like about 20 people asking how did you get to, into neurosurgery as a new grad okay so um so like i told you guys a year and a half prior to pa school i was working in orthopedics i swore up and down and even to this day orthos definitely has a special place in my heart um when i got to pa school the orthopedic surgeon that i used to work with um, as his, I was working as his medical assistant and his medical scribe prior to PA school. He hit me up and he was like, you know, what, Brianna, you know, I know I told you before you went to PA school that as soon as you leave PA school, I'm going to hire you as my PA. But unfortunately, right now, like, we, you know, we can't add on another person. So I was like, no problem. So then he told me that he if he found out about anybody that's looking for a PA, he would let me know. 
So then he hits me up right before I say January. And he tells me, oh my God, I have a neurosurgeon that is looking for a new PA fresh out of school. So he can train the way he sees fit. And I talked you up to him. Like I, he, he wants to meet you and he wants to hire you like now. And I'm like, oh my God, like, what'd you say, Dr. B? So he had a long conversation with him. He ended up sending me his, te- um, his cell phone. I ended up calling him. We spoke for an hour and he was like, Rihanna, He's like, listen, I, I want to meet you. And if you feel like it's a good fit, I want to move forward. So I was like, OK, at this point, it was January. COVID didn't happen yet. And my school allows us to do two student generated rotations and it could be out of state. So I was like, let me put through a rotation with you and let me make it my last rotation so that if it's a good fit, we can just transition into me working for you. So um, then March came. I flew back to Florida. Um, I had already met him. I think I flew back in February or something and I met him. I shadowed him in his office. I loved him. He loved me. I was like, I'm ready for this. Um, Dr. B, the orthopedic surgeon, calls me in March and was like, "Um, yeah, I can hire you now. I was like, what? He was like, yeah, I'm taking you back from the neurosurgeon I just introduced you to because I'm able to hire you. I was like... Okay, this is a very uncomfortable situation. So I flew back in March. I met with Dr. B, the orthopedic surgeon. Um, He offered me a position and I was like, Dane, like, you know, neurosurgery was unknown to me. I had never been in the field. I didn't know much about it. Um, Of course, we had a section in school where we learned about it and I aced it. I freaking loved it. It was amazing. It was definitely hard, challenging, all that stuff that I like. But I was like, ortho is something that I know. You know what I'm saying? And then other than that, my first rotation in my uh, in my clinical year was orthopedics, and I actually got offered a position off of my first rotation in California. I declined it because I didn't want to stay in California. <laughs> but girl, look at you, girl! Like, oh my god! Oh, I know. So I was like, you know, when he offered me that position, I was like, Dane, I ain't signed anything with the neurosurgeon, so I'm gonna go back with Doctor B. God has a funny way of showing you where you should be because uh, I. Finished school. I'm about to take the pants. Dr. B calls me back and tells me that he's no longer able to hire me again. I was like, no, Dr. I got to the neurosurgeon. I'm not coming anymore. You won't do this to me. I was like, see, I knew I should have the out of lines. So um, I ended up not being able to work for him. You told the neurosurgeon already you were about to. You told him. I had told him, I was like, listen, Dr. B hit me up and said he's able to hire me. And, you know, I know him. I know his office. I know his patients. That's where I'm more comfortable. And the neurosurgeon, he was such, he was so nice about it. He was like, listen, Brianna, he's like, trust me, I completely understand that's that's your home and you feel more comfortable at home. And I was like, absolutely. So he, you know, he respected my decision and he was like, hey, just keep in contact, whatever. So like I said, Dr. B ended up hitting me up. I was like, oh my God, this sucks. So I took my pants and I'm starting to apply to jobs. Um, and it's funny, I go on to Indeed and I type in jobs in Fort Lauderdale. And the first one that came up was in Delray Beach at the office that, you know, that the neurosurgeon works at. So I was like, is this a sign? So I was like, okay. So I applied and then I still had the office manager's email. So I sent her an email. I was like, hey, I don't know if you remember me, but um, I saw your ad. I applied to it. She texted me back like immediately and was like, I need you to come in our office tomorrow for an interview. I was like, okay, no problem. <laughs> so I went in the next day and they were like, yeah. Uh, we're not losing you again. So come on, sign the dotted line. So I was like, okay, cool. Sounds great. Oh so God. yeah, absolutely. So I didn't, I didn't actually, yeah, I didn't actually agree to anything until probably November. Yeah. Cause it was after my birthday, my birthday's in November. And then I started with them December 1st. So December 1st was my first day working in neurosurgery. Wow. 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 So it's been oh, two months now. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Three months. Wow. So how exactly. You- March first will be three months. I love it. I my doctor, like I'm truly blessed. Like everything since getting into PA school, my entire journey until now, I am just truly blessed. Like the other day, I just found myself on my knees, like just thanking God because I'm just so happy at the space that I'm in. Uh, the doctor I work with, he's known in the community. He's big. I mean, he's he was on the news the other day being interviewed. Um, he's in the latest and uh, the latest technologies um, for Parkinson's treatment. Yeah. We're about to be we're about to be inducted into a big trial. So my name is going to be associated with all these big things. But apart from that, he is just a wholehearted. He's just a great person. He truly sits down with patients. He will spend thirty minutes with you if you need it. 
And he makes sure you leave there well-educated. And because of that, I'm learning so much because he's teaching his patients, which inadvertently he's teaching me. So it's great. Um, so since December 1st, at first I was just, you know, kind of just watching him, see what he does. Now what happens is I'll see all his patients. I'll do their physical exam first. I'll take their history. I'll do their physical examination. I'll, you know, come up with differentials of what I think is going on, what I think we should do for treatment options. And then I come, you know, like pretty much like what you would do in your clinical year. I come and I speak with him, even though it doesn't feel like presenting anymore. And I definitely don't get pimped. You guys will understand that when you get in PA school. But um yeah, we just have a conversation and he's like, well, what do you think? And I'm like, listen, she has cervical myelopathy and we need to get MRI stat and she needs a fusion. Like <laughs> so, no, and it's like, it, it's so crazy how much growth I've had in two months. But once again, like, I have a wonderful teacher who loves what he does. He's been practicing for 31 years and he's just as excited as I am. So it's amazing. It truly is. I'm, I'm in a great place. So I've only been in the hospital, I've only been in the, the office, um, it's Monday through Friday, pretty much nine to five. And because he's actually in surgery Monday through, um, Monday through Wednesday, and then again on Friday, he's only in the office on Thursday. So on Thursdays is when I'm with him. All the other days, because I haven't been credentialed, I've been kind of just hopping around with the other doctors, which is a great thing because I get to learn their style, learn how they educate their patients and things that they think are important, which has been great. Um, you know, learning how to read imaging from the different docs, what they pick up on. Um, they all do not like radiologists. <laughs> they read their own films. They do not like radiologists at all. But I mean, I, quite, I definitely understand because we've I've seen a few uh, brain MRIs that we've been looking at that they've missed some important things that could, you know, cause life and death between a patient. But anyway, so, so far, I've just been in the office. Thankfully, I just got the email that on the 26th of this month, I am credentialed. So I will start operating on the 26th of this month. Awesome. So. And, and for those who don't know, uh, credentialing is the process, like the onboarding process for hospitals doing all that paperwork. It takes months. It takes like, it takes like from, you'll get barely hired. three to four months. Yeah. It, it, yeah. It takes three to four months. It took me four months to get in the ER. It's just a lot of paperwork. You know, you're about to actually work for a, a, a big hospital system. So they got to make sure you are who you say you are. They do make sure everything's, you know, got your I's, cross your T's. So it's a bunch of paperwork. They're, you're going to be signing a lot of things, background checks, all of that. It takes time. So that's why. For if you're. Oh, like, yeah. If you're working in a private office, so the doctor also has his own office. So she was able to get in like right away because, you know, it's private. It's just, you know, that those set of people. But a, a large hospital system or just any hospital, you got to go through that process. So yep. that's, that's it's good. very annoying. Oh, my goodness. Your story is so amazing. Amazing. So, Thank you. Um, Let's see. Let me try to read so that everybody's congratulations. Yeah, I kind of answered somebody. Somebody was asking about the GRE book that I was mentioning. So once again, okay. I recommend Boosh for the math. They teach you little tricks. Like literally, there are questions that all you need to do is read the question. You don't have to do any math. You know what the answer is. Like they literally teach you little tricks like that, which is amazing. And then for the vocabulary, uh, the book, I just wrote it in the chat. I don't know if you guys can see it yet. It's the GRE Power Vocab Book by the Princeton Review. Like I said, it's very thin. Um, it's like this tall. And what I did was after they start with vocabulary from A to Z, what I do is after every few pages, they have a quiz. And the quiz is awesome because on one column, they have all the words. And then on the other column, they have like the definition, but they put the definition not in an entire sentence, just like a few words. And then you connect them. So what I did was I wrote down all the words and all the definitions. And I studied it that way. So it was very, like I said, I, I, I ended up getting like a 154 or 155 on the vocab and you need a 150. So it was definitely helpful. Girl, you go girl. So uh, somebody said, well, actually, before we go into that, I wanted to ask, um, what's going to be expected of you for like surgery? Are you going to like be like first assist? Like what, what, what yes. do you, okay. So you're going to be, okay. So, um, yeah, so for right now, um, 
I'm going to be his right hand. I will always be his right hand. Um, the expectations coming in, he knows that I've never been in neurosurgery before. So he's going to be doing a lot of teaching and explaining and walking through things. But as I get comfortable, um, he will allow me to make the first incision. I definitely will close all his cases. Um, you know, anything that we do throughout the surgery, he has two hands. I have two hands. Both our hands will be in the person. So um, once again, it's everything that he does, I would do as well. Um, yeah, pretty much that. Just being his right hand. Wow. Somebody asked how many patient Say that again? How many patient care hours did you have? That's really hard to assess because, like I said, I worked as a medical yeah. scribe for three years in the ER, and that's full-time. So for full, full-time, just say 40 hours a week, 52 weeks times three. And then I worked for a year as a clinical assistant in a psychiatry office seeing patients before the provider did. So once again, that's 40 hours, um, 40 hours per week for 52 weeks for an entire year. And then I did orthopedics for a year and a half. So same thing, 40 hours times 52 weeks for a year and a half. That sounds like so quite, quite, a, uh, quite a bit. I want to say it was over four, if I wow. don't if I can correctly. Yeah. Wow. Oh, girl. And then I did volunteering in between, too. I did volunteering at so many different places, like Memorial. Um, I did it at, like, a cancer society where I played with kids, like, in between their treatment. Um, uh, I did it with my school, FAU, with the pre-PA club. So I did, I did a lot of different things to keep myself busy. Wow. Okay. So uh, tell us about, like, your pa the patient population, most common diagnosis, typical patients that you see. Are, are you seeing patients alone now or the amount of patients you see in a day? Okay. So the doctor I work with, his max is about 17 to 20 patients a day. So like I said, I will see all his patients before he does. He doesn't go into any patient's room until I've been in there. Um, and that makes it shorter for him because he doesn't have to go through all the extra stuff. Like I said, I will evaluate the patient. I'll do their physical exam. And he knows at this point that he trusts my physical exam findings. So he doesn't redo a lot of things. Um, so when he comes in after I've seen the patient, all he does is discuss the imaging that he needs to discuss and then the plan, whether we're going to do surgery, whether we're going to do physical therapy, blah, 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 blah. So, um, yeah, and then I'll document all the patients for him which has already like literally in the first week of working his he he used to document on his phone record on his phone and then he would go home and give it to his wife and his wife would tra transcribe all his notes for him he, the first week I worked for him his wife came in the office and was like if it wasn't for COVID I would give you a hug because I am now free <laughs> like they literally would spend like four or five hours in the evening documenting patients because you know they're just not as efficient and I've been, I mean, I was a medical scribe for how many years? So like I can knock the chart out in two seconds. Um, so yeah, so I see all his patients and then um, he goes in and he discuss, he discusses the plan and the imaging. The other doctor, Dr. Packer on Tuesdays, which is tomorrow, he sees quite a bit. I want to say we've seen up to 30, 30 something patients in a day and that's nine to five. Um, same thing with him. I go in, I see all his patients, I document, I just tell him what's going on. And they, he just looks at the imaging and says, Hey, this is what we need to do. So that's about it so far. Like I said, when I get into surgery starting 26, it'll be different because I'll be in surgery Monday through Wednesday, Thursday, I'll be in the office. And then Friday I'm back in surgery and surgery starts at seven 30 and, um, it, it ranges. Like I've been looking at his schedule. He had surgery, um, today he had two cases and he ended at 12. So at 12, I'd be done for the day. Oh, so, so for three days, you don't have to go back to the office, you said? Oh, no, 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 no. Mm -mm. At, that, at this point, I'm only oh. his PA. I'm only his personal PA. So the only reason I'm in the office on the other days is because, I mean, they're paying me. So it, they'd rather be paying me doing something. Yeah. So that's why I'm seeing, I'm wow. seeing patients okay. with other patients. Wow. <laughs> awesome. Oh, my goodness. That's, that's great, 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 great. Um, so let me see if there's any questions that I missed. Okay, there, I, let me see if there's a way I can pin your social media. The underscore PA snitch. Yes, and then queen underscore B underscore 32, because I think you were missing an underscore with my main one. Oh, okay, okay. And then you said at queen underscore B-E-E underscore, B -E -E underscore 32. Oh, okay, two underscores, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, just let me know if I have that. that's her social media. 
do you have um do you have an email or i know your email but do you want me to <laughs> yeah that's fine you can use the pa snitch the pa snitch at gmail.com okay. okay this is so helpful <laughs> you guys okay, are so I'm, gonna funny. Go, I'm gonna go through the comments um a little bit for the like the first time <laughs> I'm going to go through the comments, um, try to answer a few questions, and then go through the case study, and then um, answer more questions if we have time. Okay. All right. Let's see. Everybody's just praising you. She, um, Sunni, no, I don't have to answer. Oh, we answered that. How many times did I apply to PA school? I applied two cycles. The first time I applied to 43 schools. The second time I applied to 13 schools. Someone asked, did you apply to the same schools the second time? The second time, I, it's actually funny. The schools, I, I don't think any of the schools I applied to the second time was on my list the first time, to be honest. Really? Yeah. So like, like I said, I was, I was more meticulous. The first time, I was literally just clicking on schools. Yeah. The second time, I was like, uh-uh. If I don't meet the minimum requirement, I'm not applying to you, period. Because you're not getting my money. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And you know what? Maybe this is a petty side of me, but girl, I I would have gone back to that teacher or that advisor that told you that whoever told you, you couldn't be a PA to show up in your white coat. Listen. That has your titles, your credentials. Be like, hi, my name is. Listen, Mary. no, no, it's OK. You know how I'm going to hurt them and how I'm going to bring it tenfold by allowing the same people that are in the same predicament as me get through just like I did. That's my yes, goal. That's yes. how I'm going to get back at them. Yes. Because exactly. I know that there's many, there's many people being told the same thing. And it's, it's ridiculous. And it's disheartening, especially when it's from your own people. Exactly. Your own people who are supposed to be there to support you and try to get you over that ledge. Like, there's so many things that happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, okay, how about you ask me why I received those grades during that time period? It wasn't for nothing. I didn't just slack off. You, you exactly. People go through significant turmoil throughout their lives that cause them. You know, or these people, some people have 4.0s, but guess what? They mom and they dad paid for everything. They didn't have to work. They didn't have to do this. Like, there's other people that actually dedicated their time and their lives to other people. And because of that, yeah, your grades are going to suffer in the meantime, but at least I have so much to offer. You know what I'm saying? And listen, it's those 4.0 kids that don't make it, okay? <laughs> I'm just saying that. No, no, no seriously. That, that, that does not at all define you. Look at look at you where you are now. You're working for a, an outstanding neurosurgery practice. You're about to be in surgery. You're about to be like literally open it, looking at the brain every single day. <laughs> I know. I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Like, so I hope all of you are inspired by Brandon's story. Like, if if there's like I, I wish a more like I mean a lot this is a lot for you know people that usually tune in but I mean I can't wait for people to watch the replays and you know go through this watch this video because I get so many questions um and emails students that are discouraged that have this GPA that are lacking that but you it's possible like don't ever let anybody tell you that you cannot do something that something is impossible for you it is nope. very possible and you will be great at whatever you do like a, a number is a gpa is literally a number absolutely it. It doesn't it doesn't tell you anything That's about who you are period exactly and a lot of medical schools are pass fail and i think some pa programs are leaning towards that pass fail because like like th those grades is just trying to make people more competitive but it's really like knowing your material making sure you're able to actually treat a patient you know that's what it's all about like that's the most know, important not, aspect not absolutely not absolutely so, okay, it is 7.40. We got to dive into this case study. Oh, I forgot about for that. Because this case study, you guys, is really, really, really important, especially in the ER. So I'm excited for this, Brie. Guys, I think you should include, like, your struggle, like, you know, some of the things you overcame. Somebody said that in the personal statement. Definitely include, like, things you overcame, which shows that you persevere. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that, like I said, you know, um, that's something that I have in like some of the guides that I've created um, that's on my website. Like I have all of that outlined, like, you know, even with me speaking to new applicants, if you message me and have any questions, I will gladly be able to answer any of those questions for you and give, give you little tips on that. But I definitely put that in my personal statement. Absolutely. 
Hi, Chloe. Let's Hi, Chloe. Me. Brianna, you're such an inspiration. You're oh, just thank you. I appreciate that. Hi, Chloe. Where are you from? I'm from Connecticut. Awesome. And um, Ooh, that awesome. must be cold. Yeah, oh, and there's like totally 10 inches of snow on the ground. It's not great. Oh, it's gonna it's gonna snow for like the next three nights. <laughs> yeah, that's can, awesome. you, can you tell us a little bit about your PA journey? So I just graduated from UConn with my undergrad. Um, I'm working at um, Hartford Hospital, which is the giant teaching hospital in Connecticut um, on the neuro trauma floor, actually. Oh, nice. I'm on for the case study. So I've been um, in, the neuro, in the neurosurgery step down unit since January. That wow. is amazing. Yeah. What are you working as, you said? I'm working as a, C- a PCA, which is like this oh, yes. role. Yes, nice. uh, that's that's a great way to get hours. Like, that is, um, that's amazing. The, yeah, that's awesome. All right, the patient care assistant, right, or patient care tech? Yeah, yeah. It's patient care associate. Oh, patient okay. Care technician. Yeah, it, yeah. Okay. So where I work is patient care tech. Same thing, though. Yeah. Uh, awesome. <laughs> all righty. So we're gonna start the case study, guys. All right. So Chloe, you should know all about this, then, or maybe. <laughs> something something so like i said we have a 56 year old male who's presenting to the office 24 hours status post a car accident he's coming in for back pain and an inability to urinate so i put here what is the first step of your encounter what do you think is the first thing you need to do so i'm also an EMP, so i actually go to car crashes a lot so the first thing i'm going to think of is um what was the speed of the accident um, well, how many vehicles were involved? Was he trained? Um, did he go to the hospital afterwards or was he in no pain? When did the pain onset? Um, then I'm going to, for the physical assessment, I'm going to definitely look at the back. Um, I'm thinking immediately C-spine precautions if he's having back pain post-car accident. Um, and inability to urinate, that seems like some sort of pinched nerve, something wrong with the back around the lumbar. Yeah, you, 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 Chloe, you're killing it, man. You're ready. <laughs> that is so awesome. Yes. Everything that you said is accurate. So um, the first steps that you want to do is you definitely want to get the understanding of the accident. You want to know, was he the driver? Was he the passenger? Was he restrained? exactly what was the mechanism of action was he parked and someone rear-ended them were they t-boned were they t-boned on the passenger side versus the um driver side were did they have head trauma did they have loss of consciousness uh, also the most important thing other than understanding how the accident occurred you want to know the associated symptoms a lot of times patients will not bring up something because they don't think it's related it's your job to pull that information from the patient So you want to know all the associated symptoms. He only says, oh, I can't pee and I have back pain. But more times than none, there's much more that they're just not, you know, forthcoming with. Yeah. Um, What should be the next thing on your mind? You need to start thinking of differentials. Um, So you want to always think about, you know, in in a neurosurgery practice and office, more times than none, it's not going to be anything, you know, detrimental or serious, but you should always have in the back of your mind something that can harm the patient very quickly. Um, so things that you can think about, a uh, herniated disc, um, uh, a, cerebral, uh, a spinal tumor. Um, so, you know, just think about what are the diagnosis that you are thinking that this person could possibly have. And then what should your physical exam look like? You definitely, you know, when you're in a general setting, when you're in emergency medicine, when you're in um, family practice, you know, sometimes your exam is a little bit more comprehensive. But when you're talking about neurosurgery, orthopedics, it's a little bit more centered and geared towards something in specific, but you also don't want to overlook other things. So you definitely want to do a neurologic exam as well as musculoskeletal because this is back pain. So associated symptoms, now that you asked the question, he's like, oh yeah, like I can't feel uh, the inside and the back of my thighs. Uh, I can't really feel my butt. Uh, You know, like I pooped, but I didn't feel the poop coming out. So I don't know what's going on there either. And oh yeah, both my legs hurt. Um, and you know, other than it hurting my right lower leg feels like I can't feel it. So now we're getting, you know, a little bit (laughs) symptoms that he should have been forthcoming with, but he didn't give you that, um, 
you know, that, that information. So I have a little picture here of what saddle anesthesia is um, and where it's affected. So that little circle is where the patient will feel the abnormal sensation that they're complaining about. So physical exam. Um, other than, like I said, uh, Chloe, you know, you want to make sure you do um, a musculoskeletal and a, a neurologic exam. Like, tell me some of the um, the musculoskeletal exam that you think I would do. That's part. That's good. That's a great step. So with the musculoskeletal, you always want to make the patient stand up. You want to put them through different range of motion, depending on, like, of course, if I know that they have a fracture ahead of time, I'm not going to put them through a certain range of motion. But you want to see what their baseline is and try to figure out what is causing their baseline to be at that, that point. So you would do lumbar range of motion in all the different planes. Um, I would check their strength. I would check their sensation. I would check their reflexes. Um, and then, you know, a big thing that a lot of people miss is their gait. Their gait or how they walk tells us a lot about what's going on sometimes, especially in the lumbar and the cervical spine, actually. So those are all things that you want to be able to assess. So this patient had tenderness to palpation to the lumbar spine, um, the paraspinal muscle. So if you would just reach behind you right now and, you know, press in the middle of your spine, you feel like the little uh, the ridges from the spinal process. What you want to do is go a little bit away from that. And those are your paraspinal muscles. So he's had some tenderness around there. He had absent pinprex sensation to bilateral thighs. So literally we take like a little like a thumbtack kind of thing and we kind of press around. We have the patient close their eyes and we say, do you feel this? Do you feel this? Is this dull or is this sharp? So he had no sensation whatsoever. And then we do, uh, we do reflexes. So in the picture right here, we have the patellar reflex where you take something and you hit um, uh, the patellar tendon. And what happens is a motor neuron then goes, I mean, a sensory neuron goes, it goes to the dorsal root ganglion and it tells your spinal cord, oh, you need to perform this action. So then it, the action comes out as a motor neuron, your hamstrings will um, elongate and your quadriceps will contract and that causes the reflex to happen. So that didn't happen at all. So we know something is going on in the spinal cord because it didn't produce a reflex. And then when we check the strength, we have the hip flexors, the abductor muscles, and the adductors were a three out of five. That just tells us that they're not contracting the way that they want to. And then on physical exam, while you're doing your exam, he just pees. All of a sudden, <laughs> urinary incontinence. You're like, man, you could have told me if you had to go to the bathroom. He was like, I didn't even know that I had to pee. I couldn't even feel it. For the past day, I haven't peed. And all of a sudden, I'm peeing on myself. So... <laughs> urinary incontinence. By the way, guys, I'm not making fun of a patient. I made this up, okay? But this is something that you want to be aware of because it's very important. So this is what was on physical exam. So what's the next step? What do you think? Do we prescribe this patient muscle relaxers, give them Tylenol or NSAIDs? Do we send them to the ER? Do we start them in physical therapy? Do you think we should put them on the traction therapy? What do you think? I would do an MRI scan to get a better understanding of what's going on in the back and actually see what's physically going on on the inside because you know the symptoms, but you don't know what exactly needs to be fixed. I like the sound of that. So because of that option, we're going to send him to the ER. So this is actually a true emergency. This is something called cauda equina. Um, the symptoms include what he had, saddle anesthesia, leg pain, bladder, as well as sexual dysfunction. Now, sometimes people aren't going to come in and say, oh, you know, I wasn't able to perform last night with my wife. They leave that out because they think, oh, I just had a bad night or, you know, many other reasons. So once again, when you have a patient that presents to you with a symptom, you have to ask so many more questions as to, to see if they have any other symptoms. Um, cauda equina is diagnosed via MRI, and this has to be treated surgically within 48 hours, because if you don't do it within 48 hours, that sexual dysfunction, that urinary dysfunction can become permanent. On top of that, they can have chronic pain, chronic leg weakness, and nerve root injury, which leads to other problems down the line. So cauda equina, we also call it the horse's tail because it literally looks like that. I put a picture there. So the conus medullaris ends uh, between L1 and L2, and that's when you see um, the tapered terminal ends of the spinal cord. So they terminate at about 
T12L1, and then it comes out and goes all the way down into the sacrum. So this is a collection of peripheral nerves. So what happens is in this accident, when um, you know the acceleration and deceleration caused a herniated disc, and then that herniated disc is now um, compressing the cauda equina, which is now giving him all his symptoms. Okay. So yeah, so you did a really good job. You answered all my questions. Nothing you said was inaccurate. Um, you definitely know your stuff. I'll tell you that much. So um, the takeaway is, I just wanted to say, um, one, always have the worst possibility as a thought in your differentials, because that's the one you do not want to miss. Like, what can kill my patient or what can, you know, make them paralyzed or, you know, just cause them to not have the same quality of life that they have now? Don't be tunnel vision. Um, Someone can come in for back pain and says that they can't pee. And, you know, another person might say, ah, let's forget that pee part. Go see your your urologist. I'm going to focus on the back pain and I'm going to give you muscle relaxers and anti-inflammatory. That's not the best for the patient. Don't be so tunnel vision that you forget to do other things. And more importantly, listen to your patients and ask more questions because, like I said, they might not provide the clues to the puzzle if they don't think it's relevant because they can't make that connection. It's our job to make that connection. I just wanted to end with my favorite quote, success is not final, failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. And let me tell you, I have had, it wasn't easy, but I've had a lot of courage to continue. And that's why I am where I am right now. So that's what I wanted to end with. Thank you guys for listening. Can you actually, can you actually leave your contact information up? I, just so like people have time to write it down. You can leave it up. Okay. I just wanted you to leave it up so people could have time to jot it down. Okay, turning back on screen and sharing. Sorry, I was too quick. But thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I love that she presented something that was related to the ER because this is something that she's very right about. You do not want to miss. Um, And most importantly, uh, when a patient presents with back pain, I want you guys to remember this. Every single patient that you see, I mean, if you, especially if you work in the ER, if they present with back pain, make sure to always rule that out and make sure to document, document that in your note, document all those things she mentioned that the patient is the, does not have urinary or, or bowel incontinence, that the patient does not have that saddle anesthesia where they have the numbness in the leg Um. I mean, in the groin region that the patient um, can, you know, that sensation is intact that I, I mean, I don't always document reflexes, but especially sensation that they can move, that they can um, that th- they have um, normal motor function in their extremities. Document, document those important things. Like if, if you don't think that it is, make sure you rule that out and document, put it in your chart so that they know that even if you miss it, at least that they know that you, you, you know, you thought of it, you considered it, you made sure that it could not possibly have been that. So it's, so I'm just saying always any patient that presents with back pain, there are red flags for back pain. Cause most of the time, yes, back pain is just that back pain. Like you strain a muscle, it's not always going to be serious, but as providers, we have to make sure that we rule out the worst, as she said. So always ask them those questions. Thank you so much for that. No problem. Sorry. I saw this I saw this question real quick. I didn't know if we answered that. Someone Bethany asked, do you have to re-ask for letters of rec the second time applying? So when I found out the first time I applied that my GPA was below the requirement. I already contacted all my um, the people that I asked letters for. And I'm like, hey, can you hold on to that letter? Because I'm going to need it again next year. So I already knew. So I already warned them. So, yes, you're going to have to re-ask. You're, you're going to have to send it again. Or like for some of them, I was like, hey, can you just give me the letters of recommendation? And I made like a fake email and I uploaded them myself into the into Casper. <laughs> oh, girl, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. And thank you so much, Chloe. Are you still on? Yeah, I, I thought my video oh. was on this entire time. I guess I forgot to turn it on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chloe. I really appreciate you for coming on and being brave and answering some of the questions. Like you're extremely intelligent. I can see that you're exposed to a lot, which is amazing. Just take in everything that you can get, ask questions, and it will definitely help you in school and when you actually start practicing. Yeah, Absolutely. every time a PA is like doing an assessment on one of my patients, I kind of just sneak into the room and be like, hi, I'm just going to like stand here in the corner don't mind me that's awesome keep doing it <laughs> thank you Chloe. Oh, you for having me on. 
Yes, you did great on the case study. Awesome. Good luck. Thank you. Yes. Someone said, why did you choose Western U? Was it one of your top choices? Actually, Western U chose me. <laughs> so like I said, I was I was determined to get into any school. I'm serious. At this point, I was like, Brianna, you cannot be picky. Okay, look at your GPA. So um, when they actually invited me to the interview, that's when I actually dug deeper into the school itself. And I fell in love. Once again, I feel like it was ordained from God. Um, you know, that's just me. But um, when I went there, I met everybody. Um, it just... It felt like home, and I knew that's where I was supposed to be. So, yeah, they chose me. <laughs> and you had a good experience at the school. Your, your PhD. I definitely did. I as soon as I came there, I was like, "Listen, I want to be vice president." So I made myself vice president. Well, I didn't make myself, but I fought hard for the vice president position. Um, and I did everything I could to just make a difference in any way possible. Like I said, throughout PA school, there was many times where people were hitting me up, pre-PA students, you know, they they were watching my story, watching my journey, because I documented all throughout PA school. And there was a lot of people that were like, hey, would you read my personal statement? And I'm like, yeah, why not? I'd read their personal statement. I'd critique it. I'm supposed to be studying for a class, but I'm like, you know what? They really need this. So I'm going to make the time for it. So like, you know, even throughout just being able to do that. And then, like I said, when I realized that I'm reaching so many people and that I can truly make a difference, I'm like, no, I need to make this platform much bigger, which is why myself and my partner, who is a 20, uh, been in the game for 20 years now, she's a former professor of mine. We started the PA snitch to be able to help everybody. So. Wow. wow. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. That's awesome. So I uh, somebody asked, um, when did you apply to PA school? Um, so the first time, so okay, if I graduated in 2020, I got it in 2018. So I started applying in 2016 cycle. So like um when did you submit your application? Like what month? Oh, listen, because and that's another thing too, guys. If you know you're at a disadvantage, you need to apply early because it masters of science and sorry. I, People are asking, asking questions and I'm trying to answer too. So, no problem. Um, but I applied, it opened up in April. I think the second week I submitted it. I wasn't playing. The Girl, second yeah, week no. that CASPA opened. Because what I, told, what I told myself is that there's a lot, and all my friends in that I was in the program with that knew they had a good GPA, they applied the last day. Some people applied when I was getting an interview. That's when they were applying. I'm like, because see, y'all knew y'all was going to get in. I didn't. But guess what? I knew if I applied early and they had nobody else to compare me to, they were like, mm, might as well give this girl an interview. You know, we, we ain't got nothing else to do right now. So go ahead. Go ahead and invite her over. <laughs> that was my school of thinking. And it, it actually is true. I've spoken to um, quite a bit of different programs. And as the applications come in, especially the ones that have rolling admission, they start sending out interviews. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, and I tell them that all the time. I'm so glad that there's people that, you know, confirm everything that I say that it is true. Because yeah. I, I always tell them apply early because you have such a better chance of getting in when you apply early. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Okay, let's see. Um, any favorite study resources for didactic year? Um. Didactic. Uh, that I sounds like, like so wonderful. I, I used to watch Khan Academy. When I was taking anatomy and physiology, listen, Khan Academy became my best friend. You know what's so funny? I was not a video person. Really? I did not like watching videos. I didn't start watching videos until like a month before my, my boards. That's when I started watching videos. Um, wow. I don't know. The best thing for me was reading what it, whatever we were going to do that day. I would read it before. Of course, cliche, like, you know, prepare. But no, it really made a difference. If I was able to read something before class, I had no idea what I was reading. But when I got in class and the teacher started talking about it, I'm like, oh, my God. OK, that makes sense. I understand it a little bit more. And then as soon as class finished, I had this group of people. We would always talk everything out. So that that was awesome. And then we would test each other on um, PA Easy, which I think now is called PA Exam Prep. And Rosh, those yeah, were the I, I as far as questions. Yeah, our school actually, I think they made us do PA easy. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it, they made us do PA easy in Kaplan, but we had to purchase Rosh. And as a vice president, I contacted Rosh. I was like, listen, I got 98 students. What you saying? Give us a discount, bro. So they gave us a huge discount to be able to get everybody the Rosh um, package. So that was awesome. Look at you. 
Yep. Girl, <laughs> look at you going above and beyond for your class. I have yes. to. I have to. Listen, Where's and everybody says, hey, hey, Dre, can you do this? Of course I can. Let me let, I'll get back to you tomorrow, but I can do it. Like, no, seriously, because I'm like, I know, and then, you know, there's so many people that need different things. You know, they would come to me to be like, hey, Bree, the teacher listens to you. Can you tell them to postpone the quiz to tomorrow? I got you. The worst they can say is no. I've been hearing no all my life. No problem. We can do that. No, seriously, closed mouths don't get fed. Carissa said she loves that there's recorded lectures. Like uh, there used to be a, a student in our class that would record the lectures because we didn't have recorded lectures. So he would bring his phone or a, uh, a camera or whatever and literally, or his laptop and record the lectures and then post them on um, our Google Drive. Or yeah, we, ha we all had a Google Drive. That was very helpful. That was the yeah. best. I had 98 students that all studied and learned in different capacities. We all shared our notes. We all shared little helpful tips. And I'm telling you, when you were behind in a subject and you went on the Google Drive, someone else had already completed the chapter that you needed to read. And they had the, the cliff notes that all you need to do is read yeah. their cliff notes and we will ace that quiz. So yes. it, it was definitely very, you have to rely on your classmates. I've never, before PA school, I've never done group studying. I've never done any of those things. But after PA school, I never not studied alone, period. It was the best thing ever. That's true. That's true. You trust everything you 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 know about studying, it's gonna change in PA school. Everything is gonna go out the door. When they like I heard everybody say it, and I'm like, I don't know what y'all talking about. I'm gonna study alone, I'm gonna write down everything. No. Mm -mm. <laughs> and it's gonna change for every class as well. So it's just a learning experience, but it was great. I wouldn't trade it for the world. And I, it's so funny. It's like, while you're going through it, it's the hardest thing you will ever do. Like, yes. listen, like I have, a, there was a few students on, unfortunately, that didn't make it to the end. It's extremely hard. Listen, I have my friends crying on my shoulder and I'm like, okay, you got two more minutes to cry and then we got to study, honey. It's reality, but we're going to get through it and we're going to get through it together, period. And you did. And you did. Yeah, absolutely. And then that's what I always tell people. I'm like, listen. It's hard, but look at it this way. There's someone before you who did it, so you can too, period. Anytime I felt defeated, that's all I thought about. And I'm like, okay, that was enough for me. Let's go. Let's get it. And I mean, I'll tell you along the way, I, fa I failed. I failed a few, because failing in PA school is different than other, um, than other, um, you know, ba your bachelor's or whatever. Like if you, in our cohort, if you got below a 71 on a test, that was failing. So yeah, I got below 71 on a few tests. But best believe I still graduated with a high GPA with honors and all that other stuff. So, I mean, it's possible. And they're the, you know, if you have a good uh, cohort and good professors, they're there to figure out what you're missing so that you can learn what you're missing and that you won't make that mistake again. Yes. Yes, guys. Make sure you screen your schools. Make sure you go get into a good school. Ask, you know, necessary questions at the interviews. It's OK to ask your school questions. You got to make sure that you're going to be comfortable there. They're going to their job is to mold you and make you like a, a, a professional a PA. So no, absolutely. I mean, it reflects back on the school. So absolutely. Yes, it's, it's a give and take. So make sure you, you know, get, you know, feel comfortable there. That it's a good program that, you know, you're going to go there and be able to learn and um, have great professionals professors and advisors. So yes. Yeah. I mean, there's uh, somebody asked that anyone fail out. There's always going to be some people that either drop out or fail. I mean, you want yeah, the whole class to pass, but we, yeah, we started with 98 people. I think we ended with 93. Mm. Okay. So it's like you lost five. Yeah, so it wasn't too bad. Yeah. Um, oh, I love this question. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but oh, no, said, what, what was your why for wanting to become a PA? That is a loaded question. That's very. That's a very loaded question. Um. So, and, and this is just my personal experience. When I worked in the ER, I saw how happy the PAs were, and then I looked at the MDs and DOs, and they weren't as happy. Um, and I actually picked their brains. I'm like, you know, and there there were a lot of doctors that I work with that they're like, you choosing PA, right? Okay, don't do not do what I did. Don't be dumb, okay? Like, literally, I had so many PAs that were my, my age now. They were 28 and had been practicing for two, three years already, paid off their loans. They were enjoying their time. They were enjoying what they were doing. Work didn't feel like work for them. Whereas the doctors, they had so much load, so much stress, so much that they had to do and you know, what they're in charge of, where they didn't have that satisfaction and the burnout was so much higher. So I was like, okay, medical school, four years, plus three years of residency, plus another two years, if I want to specialize, which I would have done. Uh, 
PA school two years straight to practicing medicine. Less loans. A million dollars? A hundred thousand or less. I was like, mm, and I still get to do the same thing. That was the biggest thing is that I can truly be there for a patient. At the end of the day, that's what I wanted. I wanted to be able to make a difference in my community, which is why I'm not stopping at neurosurgery. I'm still trying to find like a family practice, urgent care on the side to be able to still do general medicine in some kind of way, shape or form. <clears throat> but literally, it's like you have to want to love it. Like I tell everybody every day and it's cliche, but I wake up with a smile on my face. I go to sleep with a smile on my face. I'm so happy. And it shows because I have patients literally coming in, giving me gifts already. And they're like, we want to talk to her supervising physician. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm in trouble. And they're like, Dr. Zucker, don't you ever fire this girl because she's the best thing that ever happened to you. Because I take the time. I treat them that like they're my mother and my father. I treat them that like they're my family member. And it shows that I love what I do. So you have to love what you do. You have to truly research it because I know a few people that went to PA school and now they're applying to medical school. So if medical school is your is your goal, don't use PA as a step stone to get there. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. work at what, what truly defines you. You know, exactly. if, if it's not PA, that's fine. If it's not MD, that's fine. If it's a nurse, that's fine. But you have to love what you do and you have to truly research it and work alongside or shadow those people for a good amount of time to be able to know if this is truly something that you're going to want to be for the rest of your life. Girl, yes. Oh my gosh, Brie. This I think that I, there, there's been so many sessions that I love, but this session, <laughs> I feel like students got so much value. I mean, there's always value in my. Thank opinion. you. I appreciate that. I, I'm pretty strategic about who I bring on. Um, and a lot of people I bring on have like you know they're doing other things on the side. They're inspirational. Right. They're motivational. They they build different platforms. They've shown that you know how um how multifaceted PAs can be, how mm -hmm. well-founded PAs can be. So if, you, if you've if you seen like the guests that I bring on, I've had on a, I brought on a, a PA that also does finance. I've had um, PAs that, you know, that also advise, PAs that um, in psychiatry that do it. Oh, girl. I'm that is amazing. I love how intentional you are. That's great. That is beautiful. <laughs> and that's exactly what they need. So I appreciate you for setting this platform and allowing oh, everybody to be able to share their experience and their voice. I appreciate yes. you. Yeah, literally. Because if it wasn't for her, you guys wouldn't be here. So she's amazing and I appreciate it. And we, no, we go way back to high school. <laughs> oh yes, yes, we went to the same high school, Blanchley High School. I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, I'm a little older. I'm almost thirty, guys. But, Only but, two years from that. <laughs> <laughs> but you see, we're both, you know, we're, you know, under tw under thirty, you know, in our yeah. profession. So you guys got this. And even if you're over thirty, even if you're over fifty, whatever. Oh yeah, I had I had people that was in my cohort that was in their second and third career. I had I think the oldest person was maybe. 55? Wow. There is no age limit. There is yes, no there's age not. Limit. There's not. I think the oldest in mine was like in her 40s, like mid to late 40s. Yeah. Okay, guys. It's 810. I do not want to keep uh, breathing. <laughs> you, you've shared so much, guys. Make sure to follow her on Instagram. Her Instagram. Make sure to follow her, the PA snitch, and at um, the queen B underscore the underscore no, no, queen underscore B underscore 32. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> queen underscore B E E underscore 32. That's me. <laughs> yes. And DP underscore PA snitch. <laughs>